welcome uh, and welcome back to Zooming in the weekly curatorial conversations of the Magnus with uh, Francesco Spagnolo, that's me, and every week with uh, Shir Kokavi, uh, both curators of the Magnus, but uh, this week uh, Shir was not able to, to join us. Uh, she'll be back next week, of course, uh, but uh, it's still a conversation because I have a fantastic uh, guest. Uh, we had planned this for months ago, so it's wonderful to have Nikki Green, artist Nikki Green. Uh, hi, hi, Nikki. Hi, thanks so much for having me. So, you, uh, Nikki, as you know, we, we present these conversations every Friday at noon. Uh, for about 20 minutes, we give time afterwards for, for a Q&A so that we can uh, focus every week on a specific object, array of objects, idea around the holdings of the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life at UC Berkeley, one of the largest Jewish museum collections in the world, the only one at the research university anywhere. So it, it's, it's a unique place and it's, uh, it's very special to have you here. And in a second, we're going to explain uh, why you're joining us. And uh, you, you are a partner in crime. Uh, you, you were a student at UC Berkeley, now you're an instructor there. So you're, you're a neighbor, a friend, and, and, a, and, a, and a collaborator. Uh, so it's great to have you here. It's, uh, the, the series is organized by the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life and presented by UC Berkeley's College of Letters and Science, and it's part of Arts and Ideas Live Online. And uh, just a few reminders on the, on the rules of engagement here for our audience. Um, People are still joining in, but I, I see the numbers going up. Uh, um, this is a Zoom webinar, so just Nikki and I are on screen and everyone else, all of the audience is uh, muted, invisible, but very much uh, um, participating. How can you participate? You can use the Zoom chat to ask technical questions. And I wanna uh, already thank our colleague, Nat Hunsan for uh, moderating the chat and also managing the Q&A. So you go to the bottom of your screen. Typically, there is a there is a, a button for the chat if you want to from from home. You want to ask technical questions. You can also let us know when is it where is it that you are zooming in from. Just uh, uh, you know, it's good to know uh, where everybody is is uh, is coming from and joining us from. And uh, and if you have questions along the way or towards the end of our presentation, you can all, again go to the bottom of your screen. There is there should be a little button with uh, with balloons and and the letters Q&A, you click on that and you can ask away. If you want to reach us, uh, we're available every week, every day, pretty much at magnus at berkeley.edu. And also we have a website that highlights a lot of what we do and also keeps um, YouTube videos of these conversations. We're recording them and making them available on YouTube and through our social media uh, channels, magnus.berkeley.edu. Uh, what brings us together, uh, uh, Nikki, is, uh, is a work that you did and uh, we're going to talk a bunch about this, but we're also going to give context and kind of tell the history of how uh, we came to work together. Um, push, pushing buttons. Uh, we thought we would call it that way because we are kind of pushing buttons today together. Old and new buttons, prayer shawls, Karai Jews, and subversive rituals uh, with Nikki Green. Um, the, the focus uh, today is on four topics. We tried to articulate our conversations around four topics. Um, we're talking about the exhibition, the Karaite Canon, is an exhibition that was presented at the Magnus uh, a little over two years ago in 2008, beginning of 2018, that also featured your work, Nikki, but uh, was very much based on the holding, holding of the Magnus, uh, mostly from Cairo. So it was the Karaites, uh, and we'll, we'll talk a bit about that. And then we're focusing on your, on your work, on your career, and uh, you just had a, a new exhibition opening on the East Coast, the first one, if I understand correctly. So. Uh, there's plenty to learn and to explore. We're going to dive into prayer shawls and uh, between norm and subversion and, uh, and uh, look at details, especially the fringes of the Jewish ritual prayer shawls and uh, as we will see buttons. And then uh, we're talking about your work and how that came to be. And now it's part of the Magnus collection. So you also made a very generous gift. So we have plenty to, to discuss. Um, and here it is. It's uh, ritual buttons, uh, but also with a bag and new ritual object in a way that you invented for us. So we're, we're going to build this conversation together. Thank you again for joining us. Mm -hmm. um, as, as you know well, uh, your, your work was part of an exhibition called the Karaite Canon, and that was focused on, on a series of manuscripts that were brought to Berkeley by the founder of uh, the Magnus, uh, Seymour Fromer, who traveled to Cairo in 1971 and uh, went to explore 
mostly the manuscript collections of the Karaite community in Cairo at the time. It was a time, you know, between wars with Israel, and uh, it, was, it was a time in the Middle East where that kind of travel was possible, and a time in which cultural heritage was, uh, was very much in shift, and even its future uh, was uh, very much in, in shift. We have experienced in other parts of the world in the Middle East sim similar uh, concerns, and we have concerns these days too about the future of cultural heritage, right? So it's uh, it's it's an ongoing uh, an ongoing project to to collect, to chart, to document. Um, the the photos that we see here are especially of the manuscripts that did not come to Berkeley that they photographed. They were in foreign codices and and other uh, materials that were documented at the time, mostly photographed. But then the manuscripts that were brought about fifty manuscripts. Uh, dating from the 17th to the 20th century. So a wide array of, uh, of dates and, and also content. And, uh, and the exhibition includes the manuscript, but also objects like this uh, pretty incredible inlaid uh, Torah case from Egypt, uh, late 19th century. And uh, here are manuscripts, a lot, a lot of, a lot of um, liturgical manuscripts like this one from the 18th century. Uh, it, it highlights one of the uh, the most famous songs for the for the Sabbath table, Mitiel, uh, that's sung among many many Jewish communities around the world. Uh, but uh, a lot of the uh, the manuscripts have annotations about the Karaite community. Karaites were a group that started around the ninth century and sort of diverged from normative rabbinical Judaism. Um, and their name is also ambiguous. Uh, but essentially, the idea was to rely on the letter of the biblical text and observe it to its literal, uh, its literal uh, implication in semantic uh, fields. Uh, so all of these manuscripts really documents uh, the life of a community. They are in many languages. It was a community in Cairo that for centuries had a lot of travelers and connected with other Karaite communities around the world from Eastern Europe to the Middle East, Turkey. And then eventually a sizable portion of this community of, of Karaite Jews from Cairo moved to the Bay Area. So there are also materials that were acquired later uh, and they were collected later or created later. And like is the case of the photograph that uh, San Francisco photographer Ina Nowinski uh, did kind of uh, building up on this initial trip by Seymour Fromer, uh, by documenting the lives of Karaite Jews, both in Egypt and in the Bay Area. There's an importance to Karaite community in the peninsula, just south of, of San Francisco. These are some of the, of the photos that Ira uh, took at a time out of a fantastic collection of, of, of images. Uh, and this is your work that was displayed in, in the exhibition. Uh, so let's, let's talk a bit and hear from you, Nikki, about your work and, uh, and uh, where do you start? Uh, you, you are a transdisciplinary artist. Uh, you've collected a number of prizes and, uh, and, uh, and honors, and uh, you've been studying in the Bay Area, but you're an, a, a lovely transplant, so we're, we're really lucky to, to have you here. And, mm -hmm. uh, and most recently uh, graduated with an MFA from the uh, Department of Art Practice at UC Berkeley. So, it's now your turn to tell us about yourself. Oh, Expose. Well, Expose. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much, Francesco, and to Shir, um, who's not here, for inviting me to, to do this. It's um, really um, a gift to get to revisit this work and to be in discussion about um, so many topics that uh, are so inspiring and fascinating and something I can kind of um, revisit again and again. So thank you. Um, so I, I guess I'm just going to sort of contextualize the work that was in this show um, briefly, but I wanted to start with this image, um, which is a still from season six of Sex in the City, which um, was to me my sort of first introduction to um, the ritual mikvah. Um, this is a scene where um, the character Charlotte is completing her conversion to Judaism. And um, when I saw this, uh, when I saw this image or when I saw this moment in the series many years ago, I had this kind of revelation that um, the tiled mikvah space is a, um, is a space, is potentially an object that is in the language of ceramics, um, a material that I had been working with for a very long time since high school. And 
Um, that sort of moment of clarity launched a um, now, you know, sort of like through my adult years uh, fascination with mikvah, but also with ritual objects. Um, so, so Nikki, let me rewind for a second. So <clears throat> sure. you, you grew up as an artist working with clay and it was mm -hmm. in the city. So a, a popular TV show depiction of uh, one part of the conversion ritual to Judaism, the mikvah is a ritual bath where, where prospective converts immerse themselves three times reciting blessings in order to uh, purify and complete this, uh, this uh, transitional uh, process, right? And uh, it's also the mikvah is used uh, typically by, by men and women in, uh, in Judaism to purify themselves at various times in their, in their life and life cycles. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not just for conversion, but, uh, let's, let's remember that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a space, it's a tiled, as you said, a tiled uh, space that uh, contains water. And these are all elements that started playing in your work a lot. So sex yeah. was the... Was yeah. The and thank you for that clarification. I mean, there's a lot of um, practices and uses of mikvah. And this was really, for me, like the introduction of this ritual and um, or introduction to this ritual. And it really kind of launched a lot of um, research and um, particularly research in the form of uh, studio work. So making sort of objects that to me spoke to this idea of immersion and water ritual. Um, alongside that, I was also doing a lot of research about mycology. I was sort of, I think at the time, really grasping for something to speak to um, uh, these ideas of both queerness and transness, but also a way to kind of link this, uh, these life experiences to um, my Jewish um, upbringing and as an adult sort of coming back into a more consistent Jewish practice. And so I began doing research about um, Jewishness, Jewish bodies, et cetera. And I came upon kind of um, quite randomly, actually, um, this text uh, on the left. Um, it was left of the screen, yeah. It's an anti-Semitic yeah. book, right? Right, so this is a piece of um, Nazi propaganda that is in the form of a children's book. Um, and it very much is sort of anchored in this idea of um, almost a field guide to um, noticing or identifying Jewish people um, out in the world. And so there's all of these anecdotes about, um, you know, the Jewish body being a, um, a poisonous body, um, like the poisonous mushroom, and that poisonousness really stemming from um, the German Jewish body uh, assimilating into um, a larger, say, Aryan society. And, and so that sort of flexible shifting visibility being a quite threatening um, component. So in a way, moments of passage through clay seems to be a, a, a red thread through what you're suggesting, uh, offering to us today. I remember uh, visiting your studio at UC Berkeley when you were working on, on, on what we see right now and, and you showing me a copy of this horrifying book that I knew but in passing and, and holding a copy in my hands was a whole different thing. This is a book for children, right? So to teach yeah. children how to identify Jews as poisonous mushrooms who can pass as uh, regular people in society. And uh, so transitional times. And, and I, I loved how you, you turned this into a, actually a, a springboard for creativity. So instead mm -hmm. of uh, suffering the, the, the mark of infamy or racism, you really created a response that, as you were saying, got you to work in mycology. So a lot of your, a lot of your clay uh, reforms uh, sprawling mushrooms, right? Yeah, I mean, I, a lot of the work that I was doing while I was in um, grad school at Berkeley was um, thinking about what it, what it would mean to share space with these mushrooms, um, with these poisonous mushrooms. And so um, really making work that I considered figurative, regardless of how sort of um, human the, the figures felt. And so, um, you know, on like, I guess the, the middle image on the screen 
um, is this head sized, like human sized, human head sized um, mushroom form with this uh, nose sort of like pushing out between the gills of the mushroom and sort of starting to blend anatomies. Um, whereas the image on the right side of the screen is this, you know, waist high mushroom and starting to sort of um, think about the the mushroom or the sculpture of a mushroom as a figure and sort of filling space with with these forms um yeah and more of these forms that develop in uh, in a variety of containers and in a way water and mushrooms and liquid and mushroom and, and fluidity seem to be uh, themes that recur in your work yeah and i mean i think that this piece which was commissioned by the contemporary jewish museum in san francisco for their um ritual object invitational um in 2017 um they they invited me to uh create reconsider um a sabbath ritual object and i had been thinking about the mikvah as um in relationship to the fermentation crock that there was this kind of a uh, similar immersion happening and sort of transformation that's occurring underneath the surface of the water or the brine in the case of um, the fermentation crock. And um, I sort of imagined what a ritual around um, consuming fermented food, so like pickles, let's say, on the Sabbath might look like, and then um, creating the object that that would then um, potentially be utilized. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think that this piece in particular began to um, blend both my interest in functional ceramics and uh, the creation of functional objects with this interest in mycology and the kind of um, textural sort of patterns um, of, of mushrooms. And so this piece um is from last year um and is the the largest work that i've made to date um which is really i think and uh I've, I've, I've seen you transport these uh, some of these mm. objects i know they're large and and it's it's really a labor of love to create these things and keep them and 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 display them so there is a lot there to unpack in yeah all kinds of directions for sure yeah yeah and here we are at, uh, at the show that you just opened. Yeah, so this Where is, is um, this is my um, solo exhibition called Between Washing and Unwithering. And it just opened last week um, at Lice and Keen Gallery in downtown Boston. Um, and this is my, my first solo exhibition on the East Coast, which is really exciting and um, contains a, a number of different pieces, including actually some of those larger um, mushroom figure forms, um, as well as this new work that um, we're looking at here, which are um, stands for five gallon buckets, which um, refer to the sort of practicalities of um, a specific congregation's um, tahara rituals, which are the, the bodily um, washing and sort of immer um, immersion rituals around sort of death and dying practices. Um, I had found out from a uh, from a colleague that the the work they had been doing with their community to um, to care for and prepare the dead in their community before burying was happening with five gallon buckets and. On one hand, it was really horrifying, and then on the other hand, it was really kind of exciting to me that these kind of um, uh, what feel like very utilitarian and ubiquitous objects would get used for something so significant as preparing the dead. And so I really wanted to find a way to kind of make these objects more holy. So what, you know, remembering uh, visiting your studio and working with you, like the, the multiple layers of our work continue to, to be fascinating. In this case, if I understand correctly, in the gallery, actually there is water dripping into the buckets. So, so you, you've also been working on plumbing, not just on, on, uh, on containers and, and, and clay. So you're, you're really going across all kinds of different media. 
uh, but uh, what, what I continue to find fascinating, I'm sure that people who are watching us from home uh, can, can partake in that, is the, the multi-layer from the deeply textual analysis and sort of intellectual uh, uh, um, connections to, of your work to, to the practicality of when the materiality working with clay and also a very strong political commitment uh, in, in your work. And it's, it's fascinating to see all of these things and how ritual plays a, an ongoing, ongoing role. So uh, as, we, as we describe all these components, let's uh, kind of zero in into the political and see how we can like, tell the story of how we collaborated, because that was actually also a lot of fun. Um, yes. um, I remember as I was uh, creating the exhibition on the, on the Karai Jews, uh, inviting you to see the materials and we, and I, I had an instinct and I wanted to show you specific item and then of course you surprised me and that's the beauty of the collaboration between curators and artists is this uh, ongoing discovery and surprise. So we looked at, uh, at a variety of prayer shawls and prayer shawls just as a, as a reminder in, uh, in, uh, in uh, traditional Judaism originate from actually item of clothing. Um, and then became ritual objects, and they're worn in morning prayers and, and during the Sabbath. Um, and but they used to be everyday clothes, essentially cloaks that people that people wore. And then something happened to them, which is that they kind of blended together with a, a commandment from uh, from the uh, Hebrew Bible, the Book of Numbers: speak to the Israelite people, and instruct them to make for themselves fringes on the corners of their garments throughout the ages. Let them attach a cord of blue to the fringe at each corner. So the fringes that we see here are, are exactly a kind of like a speech act theory uh, version of the observance of the, of the Hebrew Bible uh, in which the, the, the text is embodied in this practice of threading uh, fringes, which in Hebrew are called tzitzit or tzitziot, the plural, uh, to, to these garments. But they're also attached to personal garments. So some people wear them every day as, as items of clothing. So these are undergarments. They're called talit katan, the small talit or prayer shawl in Hebrew. So these are all photographs uh, from the Magnus collection. And uh, they're highly personal items. Some of these were made for children. They have the initials of, of, of the child. And sometimes we even know the exact date, uh, date of birth, et cetera, of the, of the child this was made for and so on. And you, we see they have many different shapes. And I invited you to look specifically at, uh, at prayer shawls from the Karite community because they have a very special feature that we're going to explore in just a second. It's the fact that, uh, first of all, they often feature the blue uh, mentioned in the, in, the, in, the, in the Bible, but they also are attached to, to, the, to the shawl in a very, very, uh, very special way, the, the fringes. Uh, so let's, uh, let's uh, see what seeing these things did to you and eventually to all of us because of your artwork. So where did this send you? Back home, right? Yeah, so this sent me back home. This is um, an image of my uh, bar mitzvah materials that um, I brought to the Bay Area with me from um, my parents' house uh, in uh, Boston. And um, I, I think after looking at all of these you know, beautiful historical objects that the Magnus was also kind of interested to um, sort of re reevaluate, re-inspect my own talit that I was given for my bar mitzvah. Um, and so I did that. So I went right to sort of my source of ritual objects. And then these are your photos. So you really zeroed in on these, uh, on these attached fringes, right? So that are in a way movable. They're not just- yeah. They, unlike yeah. the traditional, the traditional fringes, which are threaded through a hole in the corner of the, of the shawl, these can be put on and off. So most likely the Karaite Jews apply this, their sense of literalism to the idea that thou shalt put the fringes on the corners by being able to put them and also take them out. A fairly subversive uh, way of thinking about ritual uh, compared to the normative one, right? Right. And I think that, you know, for me, a lot of my um, art practice and the, and the, the act of research is also um, deeply inactive looking of like deep looking. And so the thing that I noticed was how different the connection points of the tzitziot um, on the karate, um, the like on the karate talit was so different than the one that I had been given. And that was fascinating to me and sort of launched me into this uh, 
sort of research sorry. and thinking. So this is the difference. On the right hand side, we have the normative one, sort of rabbinic Judaism normative uh, uh, fringes that are threaded to the corner. And on the left, Karite, which can be either loops or buttons, and they sent you into a whole direction of buttons. And here yeah. But you also ended up embroidering a new bag just for the, for the fringes. The, the bag on the left is inscribed tzitzit, meaning rich yeah. fringes. Right? Yeah, and so, you know, on my bar mitzvah talit bag, the bag says talit, um, is embroidered with the word talit, um, and inside the bag is the entire talit, the, the piece of cloth with the tzitziot um, threaded through permanently into the corners. And so I think I was just really sort of fascinated by this idea of what does it mean for the tzitziot to be able to be removed? And could there be sort of ritual developed, considered around that act of um, removing and placing? Um, there was something really kind of beautiful to me about I, that. I decided to share with our audience also the text that you wrote or they kind of wrote together around this, uh, yeah. this work. But we thought, you know, I'm just reading the bottom. We thought about the buttons and loops Karai Jews used to attach fringes to their prayer shawls as a way of making the ritual practices distinct from other Jewish ones. Why then would the Karaites use a practice that suggests fluidity? Is there a functional purpose beyond distinction? We had all kinds of really neat conversations back then, right? And yeah. so this project seeks to identify that even in the most direct and fundamental interpretation of text, one is always adapting and filtering law and practice through the lens of one's body, offering a place for expansiveness and innovation. Thank you so much, Nikki, for creating this work, for donating it to the Magnus. And as a reminder, you can use, and I see there are already some questions, so we're going to jump on that. You can use that from home. Uh, we, we, people can use uh, the Q&A function to ask uh, questions. And actually, the, the topic of ceramics and clay will return next week. Shir will be back. And, uh, and we'll be talking about a porcelain set between Paris, Istanbul, and Berkeley and the Camondo family that, uh, that owned it. Um, I'm going to just stop sharing the screen and instead uh, have the two of us uh, read together um, the questions. These are all really uh, questions, mostly for you. How do you fire such large objects, Nikki? Um, in a lot of different ways, in the case of that, quite large um, immersion tank with a very large kiln. Um, I traveled to uh, California State University at Long Beach um, that houses enormous kilns, um, specifically to make work at that scale. But um, at home in my own studio here um, in the Bay Area, I build work in sections and then fire the sections and then reassemble the work afterwards and really kind of lean into this idea of seams and breakage and uh, the kind of complicated nature of that. I, I've seen you working. It's really hard labor among other things. I mean, I, yes. I, I, I know this of sculptures. You guys are, you know, <laughs> courageous people in bravery yeah. matter in the way you do. Uh, there was another question. First of all, uh, Molly's writing, Nikki's work is amazing and so inspiring. And she's wondering, where does your press process begin? Does the ritual connection emerge from your relationship with clay materials or does the ritual inspire your choice of material and the object's form? Mm, it's a great I, question. I, I'm not gonna even try to answer <laughs> it. <laughs> it's all yours. I mean, you know, the, the sort of quick answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but both and. Um, I think that it's, uh, you know, again, this process of looking, um, a, a deep process of looking, um, so, you know, in the case of Ritual Buttons, this, this work that I made um, for the Karate Cannon exhibition, um, it was very much about the, the ritual and the ritual objects um, that I was looking at and this kind of observation of a distinction between um, my, my own sort of experience with, uh, with the Talit, with my Talit, but also, um, you know, I'm very interested in materials. I work in clay and I work in a lot of other materials as well and they all kind of bleed into each other and there's kind of an endless opportunity to consider uh, how these materials function in the world. So, um, so I'm always sort of pulling from the, the objects and materials around me. 
Nikki Green, thank you so much for being uh, with the Magnus and with all of our many uh, uh, participants in today's webinar, uh, zooming in. Uh, and, uh, you know, we hope to see your work in person very soon and uh, um, continue to think with you. We know we have a friend and a colleague in you to think with you about the politics of ritual, which are a topic that is very dear to the content of the Magnus mm -hmm. and, and our practice as well. So uh, this is just the beginning of uh, many more conversations. So thank you again so much. Thank you. And thank you, care. everybody at home for following us. And please follow the, uh, follow the, the, the links that Nat uh, uh, is been posting to the chat to know how to register for, for the coming presentations. We're here with you every week at noon on Friday. Thanks again, Nikki. Bye, Bye. take care. Bye.